So I grew up in Damascus, Maryland. Where's that? Um, it's about 15 miles east of here, southeast of here. Okay, so it's not that far from here? Nope, yeah. And, and did you go to public school? I did go to public school, but I went to like magnet schools, so I didn't always go to my local home school. So for example, I didn't go to Damascus High School, I actually went to Poolsville. Poolsville. So, mm -hmm. What is a magnet school? That's like, basically you test into it and you go to it if you're considered like advanced in uh, studies. Okay. And what's your name anyway? <laughs> Mandy Bernard. Mandy Bernard, okay. I will probably introduce you better. <laughs> Just supposed to be a talk. Um, so, so yeah, and then you went to college, St. Mary's. Yep. Yep. Well, why'd you go there? Um, it was in-state was the main reason why, and I didn't want to go to Maryland because it was too big. So St. Mary's College of Maryland is um, right down there on the water, so it's a very pretty campus. It only has about two thousand people, which was really attractive to me. I majored in English and I minored in film studies and art. So mostly photography is the art that I was doing. Didn't you study Soviet science fiction? Yes. Um, well, Soviet history generally. Okay. So yeah, that was kind of a just following, um, you know, like once I got to college, I met a professor who was a Russian historian. So I really had no goals to study Russian history. It was just when I got there, I really liked this one teacher. So I kept taking his classes, and some of them counted towards my other majors, and some were just kind of for fun. <laughs> OK. And it ended up being a literature degree? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And you chose that topic. Why? Which topic? Literature? Yes. <laughs> Um, it was what I was good at, mainly. So I didn't go to college like thinking about what I wanted to do career-wise. I just knew that like humanities in general was what I had always been good at in school, and is what I liked doing. Okay. I want to ask you about your parents because you told me they're scientists. True. Yep. What do they do? <laughs> um. So when I was little, my mom worked in different kinds of labs. So I remember like going to work with her and she would just have like a room full of guinea pigs. And uh, at one point there was like a guinea pig who got pregnant that wasn't exactly supposed to be pregnant. So we got to have two of the baby guinea pigs as pets. <laughs> so it was just an odd quirk of growing up with scientist parents. Well, what was she doing with the guinea pigs? I don't know exactly. Um, so she you worked as, a, yeah, okay. yeah. So she just worked as like a lab technician for a long time. Okay. So she, she wasn't uh, conducting her own research? No, no. It was directed by somebody else. Where was that? That was in Rockville area, so off of like Research Drive. I think that's what it's called. Oh, yeah. And um, your dad? And my dad has worked my whole life at NIH for the National Human Genome Research Institute. So that was a big deal back in like 1993 or four when they sequenced the human genome for the first time. And at NIH, she worked at? Yep. National Institutes of, of Health. Health. Yep. Is that in Bethesda? Yes, correct, in Bethesda. So he was part of that project? In a way, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's not like the name on any of the papers. That would always be Francis Collins, but yeah. He worked for this institute that was doing that research. How long did that take? I don't know. Um, did he I mean, it's. Talk about it, about DNA? And oh, yeah. 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 Vitamin B12 was a topic over dinner. Mm hmm Yep. Um, so there, I mean, the human genome has been sequenced, but I think since they've done that, they've been interested in just sequencing the genome of as many other mammals as they can. 
So at one point my dad was working on the uh, sequencing the black bear, American black bear, just for fun. It was his job though, he wasn't doing it all. No, 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 it was, I guess it was like his kind of project, pet project at work. Okay. Uh, just one more question about your parents, they raised bees? Yeah, so that's kind of the nice story of how they met. They were working in the same lab, and my mom would always drink tea, and she'd always put honey in her tea. And so my dad always had the honey. And he always Yep, so he, he like studied beekeeping just for fun in college at some point. He had a professor who did that. So he was already doing that a little bit. And... Um, yeah, so my mom would go through the honey really fast because she was always drinking her tea with honey. So she kept coming back to him, and that's kind of how they got to know each other. So um, someday you brought her over to meet the bees? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess so. And, but and um, So now they, they still do this? A little bit. Yeah, they did it a lot more when we were really little. So like they would kind of rent the bees out to different farmers with orchards and things that needed to be pollinated. How would they transfer the bees to the orchards? Um, so basically at night you go to the hive after all the bees have come home and you just cover the opening so that they can't get out. And then you drive them over there in the middle of the night and put them down. And the next day they figure out where they are. <laughs> they go back into their... Mm -hmm. So the bees leave the hive during the day and go to flowers and, stuff, and mm -hmm. then they come home. Yep. And then somehow your dad is then able to extract the honey from the hive somehow. Right, yeah. So that process, I mean, it's basically mechanical now. So you take out the frames and you put them in this big cylinder that then spins them really fast and all the honey by Centrifugal force, I guess, just goes towards the edge of the machine. And then it's then it's out. It's extracted, and then you can mm -hmm. give it to your mom for her tea. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, right now, what are you doing? You're at Catholic University. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, I took about three years between graduating from St. Mary's and figuring out what exactly I wanted to do in grad school. I always knew I wanted to go back to grad school just because I, with an English major, the options are kind of some kind of writing and I was doing like copywriting, marketing kind of work that I wasn't enjoying. And I persisted doing it because I knew that it wasn't really my end game. So uh, for a while I thought I would go and get like a PhD in English and be an English professor. and really like the job realities of that, having to move wherever you get work because the work is so scarce and um, working, having to bring your work home with you a lot. All of that kind of just turned me off of doing a PhD. So then I decided I would do some kind of master's degree. I thought in museum studies, because um, I was interested in history and art and I guess like the literature thing, I just always thought I could use my writing skills wherever I ended up. So um, anyway, the museum studies thing, I again kind of backed away from that just because you wind up having to be more specialized than I wanted to do. So in order to like be a curator, you basically need a PhD in whatever subject you're going to be curating. Although, I don't know, you're a curator. I'm a PhD <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway, I eventually decided I would do a library science degree, and that way I could kind of transfer between a lot of different organizations that I was interested in. So, um, library science people end up in museums, they end up in libraries, and archives, which is mainly what I'm interested in. Um, so Catholic is actually only like one of two schools in the area that offers a library science degree. And it just so happens that basically for that reason, um, I'm like the third generation of my family to go to Catholic University to get a library degree. <laughs> so my grandmother 
went and also my uncle uh, went. Okay. And it just so happens that my other grandmother, so my paternal grandmother, was also a librarian, but a school librarian. And are any of you Catholics? Um, t yeah, I guess. So my grandmother, my mom's mom, was raised Catholic, and she says she's still Catholic, but she doesn't really go to services or anything, okay. as far as I know. But, but you, you do go to Catholic University. Yeah. And, and you're now, so you're studying from a master's there mm -hmm. in library science, and, and you're working there. Correct. So I got a nice offer to go there, where basically I have a position working in the archives for two years, and through that I get free tuition. So it's a two-year... Yep, and I'm about halfway, so... One year left. Are you enjoying it? Uh, I enjoy the work. I, I'm not particularly enjoying the classes, just because they're kind of dry, <laughs> which I think a lot of library school people would agree. Plus, you got a long commute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, how'd you end up in Sykesville? So, um, I moved here with my boyfriend, and we'd been together in college, then we'd both moved back home with our parents, and uh, sort of, I don't know, did the long distance thing, but always wanted to move out when we had enough money. So, it just kind of worked out that when we had enough money, then we found um, an apartment over at Sykesville Apartments. And so, you were, you, what, what range were you looking in, like, what was affecting well, so he was working in Westminster, okay. and I was working in Rockville. So this ended up being sort of a midpoint. It's a little longer for me, but okay. that's okay. Okay. So you're in the Sykesville Apartments now. Mm-hmm. Um, Funnily enough, his parents lived here back in the 80s. <laughs> in Sykesville? Yep. And also his grandfather, who was a... Um, Psychiatrist, psychologist, I'm not sure which, at um, Springfield. I believe you told me about him, but we won't go off on that. Very okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, at some point, you got somewhat interested in Sykesville's history. Yes. Now, how did that begin? Um, I mean, it's like, how could you not be interested in an abandoned mental hospital? So that was kind of just like the itch sitting right over there that I had to scratch. And I don't know, we just would go for walks over there and bike around. Um, Hallie, so you, you developed some specific questions, like one about William Patterson, what was that question? Yeah, um, I guess, so after I had gotten interested in Springfield and just sort of uh, the general history, then I started actually reading histories when I had time, so that was sometime last year around Christmas. I have a nice Christmas break from Catholic University, so it's like three weeks of not having to do anything. So um, at that point I just started reading all the histories, and it bothered me a little bit that the way that the Bonaparte-Patterson connection was usually brought up was very perfunctory. So it was kind of like, well, William Patterson had been living here, and he had this daughter who then married Jerome, but they weren't really here most of the time. They were really mostly in Baltimore. So it just seemed like there wasn't enough detail about, well, what were they doing in Sykesville? So anyway, it Sykesville was their summer estate. And, um, well, I, I could just say a little bit more broad about who the Pattersons were. Sure. So, um, so William Patterson came here in like 1766, so just before, about a decade before the revolution. Um, and he was an Irish immigrant. He was like an apprentice at an accounting firm. And basically he was really sharp. So he picked up on the business really quickly. And they were doing a lot of shipping industry stuff, being in the port city of Baltimore. Um, so anyway, Fast forward 10 years, he's about 24 when the revolution happens, and um, Washington's army had very few supplies, and particularly ammunitions, because once things in the colonies were getting bad, 
the British wised up and stopped sending arms <laughs> and stuff like that to the colonies. So um, William Patterson was able to sh like use his ships, and he apparently invested everything he had in these two ships. And they sailed over to France and got some arms and munitions and um, sent them back to Washington's army. And is that how he ultimately got rich? Yeah, so he... That, I think, is like the foundation of his money. So he came back. He basically was at sea for like the entire Revolutionary War. So he came back about a year and a half later, and he had $100,000 saved up. Um, and then he started being really prudent about buying real estate. And he never bought real estate to like flip it the way that people do now. He always bought properties that he was going to hold on to. So... Uh, Springfield is an example of that. So, so he bought Springfield, as far as I can tell, about 10 years after the Revolutionary War. So around 1786. 1786. Mm -hmm. That's when he bought Springfield. Mm -hmm. okay. So he, that's the other thing that was kind of hard to find because he didn't just buy the 3,000 acres outright. A lot of people already owned little pieces of the land over here. So he pieced it together um, just over time through little purchases from the neighbors. The first property I can tell you was Cheney's Neglect. Cheney's Neglect? Mm -hmm. How big was that? Um, 108 acres. Okay, and it was somewhere within what became the entire Springfield complex? Yep. Do you know how much he paid for that? Uh, I don't know offhand. Okay, so he started out with 108 acres called Cheney's Neglect. <laughs> yep. Um, then he basically just kept buying from his neighbors. So I don't know how that worked exactly if they were, I, I don't know if it was like a little bit of a strong arm thing or if they were willingly just like, oh, sure, I don't use that side of my property. Go ahead uh -huh. <laughs> and have it. So, but eventually he put together a contiguous yes. land mass, basically, that got yeah. really big. Yeah. So under his... Um, ownership. I think it reached like 1,700 acres, so it wasn't as big as when his son had it. Did, do you know if he did anything with the land? Um, I know that he did not cultivate it really. It was mainly there as their summer estate. So they would come here in the summer months when Baltimore was really dangerous because there'd be these yellow fever outbreaks. Um, of course, they didn't know at the time what was causing it. They just knew being in the city was worse than being in the country. So, what was causing it? Mosquitoes were mosquitoes, causing it. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so they were They came out here to get away from the deadly mosquitoes. Yes. And, and did, ultimately, they had a big mansion. Was William involved in that? Do you think, or did that? Well, he must have, right? Yeah, I have seen like a record. I can't remember the year. I think 1790s ish, where. Um, Someone came by and like appraised the different outbuildings and stuff he had. So at the time he had a quote well finished uh, log house, some kind of log barn, and a slave quarter. So he did have some slaves, but I don't assume that they were field slaves. I'm thinking they're more like house servants, all slaves. Right, yeah, he didn't have a big operation or anything out here. Okay. So what made him really famous? His daughter. Okay. <laughs> what did she do? She... What was her name? <laughs> well, she's half the reason we're here today. So um, she was Betsy, and that's the best picture of her... Well, she thinks it was the best picture of herself. Um, Yes, Gilbert Stewart, who's a really well-known painter from that time period. Paint Washington, too. Yes, he did. Yeah, um, there's an interesting Catholic University story there, too, actually. So um, Catholic University has basically a forgery of that painting that was painted by, <laughs> painted by this guy. Oh, I wish I could remember his name. Maybe I can look it up. But forgery of the famous A forgery Washington. of the Stewart painting of Washington. Yeah, so um, 
basically this guy knew Stuart, sort of was friends with him or tried to be friends with him. Um, and he was a painter, but he just wasn't as good as Stuart. So he would paint paintings that he'd seen Stuart working on and then sell them as if they were Stuart's. So he, um, yeah, he, his reputation crashed and burned in his lifetime, but there are all these paintings still floating around. And there's one at... And there's one at Catholic, yeah. It's on display. Oh, uh, it's actually not on display right now, so it's in conservation, okay. um, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> and he painted Betsy, and that was her favorite. Um, yep. The painting is an interesting um, instance of actually a good relationship between Betsy and her father. So um, she had it done at some point, then Gilbert Stewart never finished it. It just sat around for a long time. Betsy inquired about getting the painting from him, and basically he refused to give it to her unfinished. But eventually um, her father was able to bribe or coax or persuade um, Gilbert Stewart to give him the painting. So William Patterson hung it in his house at South Street in Baltimore and it stayed there until he died and in his will he left Betsy this painting which was according to her the best representation of her that was ever done. How old was she at the time? That's a good question. I would estimate maybe 20. Was she married? She time. was married, yeah. So let, let's talk about who she married. Okay, yeah. That's a story. So, um, when she was 18, Napoleon's um, younger brother was on some military campaigns in, like, the Caribbean and whatnot. And he made this expedition to America and was basically wined and dined by all of the big Washington people at the time, including Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Um, and um, so Betsy heard about the fact that he was in the country and of course he heard about the fact that um, Betsy was like supposed to be the most beautiful woman in Baltimore, maybe in America. So the two of them had kind of had these rumors like planted in their minds before they met each other and had their expectations of what each other would be. Um, the first time that they met was supposedly at a horse race, but they didn't actually speak. They just saw each other, and Betsy kind of put on a show for him, it sounds like. So she had, like, some, you know, st <laughs> some nice dress and a big peacock or some kind of feather plume in her hair. And one story I read, she actually, like, reared her horse up and then, you know, trotted away. <laughs> from him. So she was showboating. Um, then the time that they actually met was at a ball. Um, and that's like a very storied kind of mythical meeting. So at the time, it was summer, which means Betsy was living out here at Springfield. Um, her father knew of her interest in Jerome at that point and so was trying to keep her away from him because he just thought he wasn't going to be a good match for Betsy, um, which he wasn't. So, <laughs> um, But anyway, Betsy, being as strong-willed as she was, actually escaped, supposedly, from Springfield and on a mule slash with a slave helper um, and some sandwiches and a nice dress for the ball rode the 25 or the 20 miles to Baltimore to um, meet Jerome. So that's the first time that they actually met. Do you believe that that's actually true? I mean, I, uh, in all the stories, don't they have different variations of the story? Yeah, there are different variations. So some of them, it's like she climbed down a wisteria vine that was on the house. Some of them, you know, it's more like the classic bed sheet thing out the window. Uh -huh. um, so I've thought about it, and my feeling is that even if it's not literally true, um, it's true as an illustration of her character, kind of in the same way that the George Washington and the cherry tree myth is kind of <laughs> pointed to as like an example of George Washington's character. So um, 
for anyone that doesn't know the story, basically George Washington was given a hatchet on his sixth birthday and he was playing around with it and chopped down this tree that his dad really liked. So his dad confronted him about <laughs> what happened to the tree and Washington just fessed up to it and said, I cannot tell a lie. And so it's pointed to um, as an example of Washington's like virtue from a very, very young age. And in the same way, I think this story about Betsy points to the fact that she was going to do what she was going to do regardless of people who you could argue had her best interests at heart. So what happened next? Um, at the ball or? Well, okay, yeah, well, sure. What okay, happened? sure. <laughs> so the at the ball is this other interesting mythological kind of like entanglement between Betsy and Jerome. So I'm, according to everybody, it was love at first sight. Um, and then there's this um, episode that's sort of recounted in one of two ways. Either they were dancing and Betsy's necklace got caught on one of Jerome's buttons, like on his jacket. Or um, the other version is that Jerome's watch chain got tangled up in a piece of Betsy's hair. So you know, whatever. <laughs> Somehow they got physically connected yeah. by accident. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what happened after that? So I'm not like totally sure what the timeline is, but within a few months, basically, they decide that they're going to get married. Um, and it's during this period that I, um, Betsy's father, William, is like trying to put the brakes on it and say, no, it's not a good idea. So he had received a letter anonymously at some point that accused Jerome of basically ruining women, um, you know, wherever he had been before. So in France and possibly again in the um, Caribbean area. Um, so of course, Betsy's father didn't like the sound of that. And then there's also sort of the insinuation that Jerome might be trying to basically get like a free house out of William Patterson so he had a lot of money of course Betsy was his beautiful daughter if he married her he would have access to a lot of William Patterson's money so he basically didn't trust Jerome's motives and his character exactly right and, and um, another aspect of it is that Jerome was only 19 at that time so uh, legally, he couldn't get married, I think, until he was 21. The French law? I don't know if that was the French law, because I've read that in the French law was you had to be 25 or you had to have the permission of your family or parents. Okay. Um, so I think it was in the U.S. you had to be 21, which... So he lied about his age? So he lied, yeah. Yep. Okay, and, and so they got married? Yes, on Christmas Eve. Um, and in fact, another Catholic university connection, <laughs> they were married by the first bishop of the United States, John Carroll. And um, the idea there was that... I'm sorry, what religion was... Catholic. Oh, so because the French were Catholic? The French were Catholic and um, William Patterson having been, um, well, I guess like English, Scottish by birth, but he was raised in Ireland. He was also Catholic. Yes. Yep. The first Catholic bishop of the United States. Correct. Yes. And this was in Baltimore. This was in Baltimore. Yep. Uh, oh, but to, to this point, does Napoleon even know what his brother's up to? I don't think so. Okay. Nope. <laughs> okay. So uh, this came as a shock and not a good one to Napoleon, who had already been marrying off his other siblings to royalty. So it was presumed by American politicians, William Patterson, anyone that was kind of, um, you know, in the upper echelons of society that it was going to be important for Jerome to marry someone royal, not necessarily Betsy, who was wealthy but not royal. Um, so they all seemed to have a sense that this was a bad idea, um, except Betsy, of course. <laughs> And Jer yeah, Jerome, um, like his reputation is just for being extravagant and wasteful. 
and he was the youngest of the siblings and it's kind of he was babied he was the baby and he was coddled his whole life so i think he assumed that he could do what he wanted and if he just went to napoleon and kind of put his tail between his legs napoleon would be like okay did not happen that way, no. So Napoleon basically threatened to cut Jerome off if he was going to be married to Betsy, meaning he wouldn't have any title or money coming from Napoleon. Um, and so with that threat, Jerome sort of gave up Betsy. And... Well, how about the fact that, they, that she got pregnant? Yep, so... Um, they honeymooned like for a while and basically just partied um, around, the mm -hmm, around the United States. And then I guess when Napoleon found out about the marriage, he recalled Jerome back to France. And so Jerome came with Betsy thinking, you know, if he meets her and we, we introduce ourselves, it'll all be okay. And Napoleon refused to even let Betsy disembark. So she wound up going to England and she was pregnant at the time and that's where she wound up having their child. Wasn't she, wasn't she uh, well received in England? Yeah, I think she was. I, I think England and was, was the only opponent that Napoleon had. <laughs> that's know, true, yeah. Yep. He blockaded the entire coast to keep her from... Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, so Jerome ultimately abandoned her. Yeah. And what did he do? So he became king of Westphalia, and he married um, another woman, Catherine of Wittenberg. Wittenberg? I don't know how to say it. It's, I know how it's spelled. But I, I know how it's spelled, too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was an arranged thing by Napoleon. Yeah, so he, yeah, so he married um, this woman at his brother's command, basically. And they had some children and whatever, lived married for a while, but they only had the kingdom for about 10 years um, before uh, basically, you know, Napoleon was ousted and then all of his, uh, you know, appointments or whatever also fell, collapsed. So he was king of Westphalia for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know a whole lot about that. So I know that he was basically demoted from king to prince. And then, as far as I know, he just lived out his life being a prince of, I'm not even sure what. <laughs> <laughs> and what did she do with the rest of her life? Was she heartbroken? I mean, yes, yeah. Did, didn't she try to, didn't, didn't Napoleon try to get the Pope to annul their marriage? And Yes, so Napoleon thought he could uh, have the marriage officially declared illegitimate and that then it would be okay for his brother to remarry. Um, but the Pope refused because it was a, um, I guess, totally legitimate match in his eyes. It was done, like we said, by the first bishop of the United States as a way to further legitimize it. Um, so according to the Catholic Church, Jerome's second marriage is not okay. <laughs> um, and that kind of, you know, for Catholics and whoever else, it kind of has like the moral authority on Betsy's side that she should have been able to, you know, stay married and have kept her title and all that. Did she keep the name Napoleon? She did, um, yeah, she preferred to be called Madame Bonaparte even though most people would call her Elizabeth Bonaparte or Elizabeth Patterson. And when it was all over, by the time it was all over, how old was she, 25 or younger? Yeah, younger, I think. So maybe 23, because I think she was married when she was 18, probably even younger than that. So I think they were only married like a, two or three years. And how long did she live? Long time. Um, so when the marriage was broken up, Napoleon actually did, you know, sort of right by her. So he gave her like a little living wage um, and she took that. I forget the exact amount. It was like 6,000 something or 60,000. I'm not sure. 
So she had basically like a yearly stipend and she just held on to that and let it accrue interest. So that's kind of like the um, nest egg that her eventual wealth is built on. So she did become wealthy. She did become extremely wealthy for a woman and especially a woman who was basically disinherited by her very wealthy father. Um, so I guess in the meantime, so after you know her marriage fell apart, she's getting this income from Napoleon until, of course, Napoleon is out of power and then it has to stop because he has basically no money to, to give her. Um, so her father dies in like 1824. Betsy lives until like 1870s. Um, but her father in the will, he did give her the painting, so we talked about that already. But he refused to give her any money, and he basically said, she among all the children, or she has caused me more trouble than all the other children combined. So he felt that he had already expended what she deserved, I think. Was that also a sort of an act of malice? Yeah, I would say so. So. And how many people did get something in the will? She was the only daughter, right? Yeah, she, she was survived. the only daughter, right. So um, there was another daughter, but she, I think, died when she was like 17 okay. years old. So that was hard for Betsy, too. Um, and I don't know, five brothers, six brothers, something like that? They all got a share. So they all, yeah. Now, yep. Um, I don't want to go off on George Patterson yet, but I understand he gave his share to Betsy. Yeah, that was actually when the mother died. Okay. So. Um, Betsy's mother died, I don't know, I guess it was still after her marriage. Or maybe it was before. Well, I've certainly before William died. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so when her money was... Right, so um, Betsy's mother, whose name was Dorcas Spear Patterson, she was independently wealthy before William Patterson ever came along. So she had a lot of money, and when she died, she instructed her husband, well, before she died, she instructed her husband to have the money divided equally among all the children. And he took it upon himself to say, no, we're only going to equally divide it among all of the male children, so thereby disinheriting Betsy. And her brother George, at that point, just felt that that was wrong, and so he gave his share to Betsy. William basically cut Betsy out of two separate wills. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if Napoleon had said, okay, Betsy, <laughs> we love you, <laughs> how do you think things would have gone? Yeah, I mean, there's, you can speculate because on the one hand, Betsy was Jerome's first marriage. And so there, I, I think there is some weight to that, like he loved her enough to actually marry her, unlike the other women um, that he sort of used and pushed aside. So maybe it would have worked out, but my feeling is that he was just not a, he, he was like not an upstanding person at all. Um, he sort of liked the thrills and the extravagance. and. Um, Supposedly, Betsy was very beautiful her entire life, but I suspect that he would have been cheating on her at some point anyway, with other women. So you think it worked out better for her in the end? That's also hard to say. So, I mean, I think you could make the argument that possibly she was spared, you know, having to see Jerome um, fall out of love with her. Um, and she was also sort of spared the humiliation of like losing the kingdom, so being a queen of some place and then having that all yeah. ripped away. But what, what did she do with her life as a young woman? Squandered it. Where? <laughs> um, in Baltimore, mostly. Did, did she spend a lot of her life in Europe? She did. So she, I mean, that's another sort of odd thing. So she had her child by Jerome. Um, that she raised a little bit, but she spent a lot of time going back and forth between 
the United States and Europe, so France and England mostly. Where she was well received, right? Yeah. Right. Um, what happened with her son? Okay, so Bo, um, he went to Mount St. Mary's College, which is in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and that was a Catholic school, or it still is a Catholic school. Um, but Betsy's ambition for him was always to kind of take up her legacy and marry the European royalty that she sort of got jilted out of. Um, and Bo did not do that. He wound up marrying a wealthy American woman, um, much like his father, Jerome. <laughs> um, so I find that particularly ironic because Betsy was the wealthy American woman that, um, you know, the other party did not want the her husband to marry, you know. And then Betsy basically turns around and does the same thing to the next generation by trying to have this, um, like, royal legacy, but then, you know, not liking the way... Um, her son actually fell in love. So, and so he actually had a, a, a marriage based on love to an American woman and kind of had no interest in all that loyalty and all that. Right, yeah. And she was, how'd she handle that? She was disappointed in him. Um, and she really did not like his wife, Susan May Williams. And, although Susan May Williams was kind of an interesting character in her own right. So during the Civil War, she was so pro-union that she was accused of like spying on all of her neighbors and turning them in um, as Confederates. And, and so they, um, Bo and Susan May Williams, they had two children, but like 20 years apart. The first son, first grandson, I should say, was like a military career man. Um, and he did not have any children, nor did her second grandson, who was Charles Bonaparte. Um, and he became like a really successful lawyer, and he wound up working for um, Teddy Roosevelt. He was Teddy Roosevelt's attorney general. And um, there's an interesting, again, like interesting Catholic University connection there. So if I should go into that now. Okay, so... Um, Catholic University was founded like 18, well, whatever, late 1800s. So by the turn of the century, the early 1900s, um, the guy who had been put in charge of the finances had basically lost all of the money in bad real estate investments. So the university had like no money that it was trying to survive on. And um, Charles Bonaparte was pretty instrumental in stepping in and helping them straighten out the finances and work through those legal battles with the guy who had been the treasurer and just uh, lost all the money. So he, he, he helped save the university? He did, yeah. And he was, what was he under Teddy Roosevelt? He was the attorney general okay. under Teddy Roosevelt. And he also... Um, so, I mean, most of his job was related to trust busting, but he wound up also establishing the Bureau of Investigation, which in the 1930s would become the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. So Jerome and Betsy's grandson was actually a very successful American politician. Right. Okay. Right, yeah. And he was also very loyal to Betsy by all accounts. So she really liked him. He took care of her. Okay. She ended up dying in Baltimore? Yep. She was in her 90s, right? Yes, yeah. What's it say on her grave? Or what's her epitaph? Her epitaph is really bizarre to me. So it's a line from Macbeth, um, and it says, After life's fitful fever, she sleeps well. So it does make sense out of context for Betsy because her life was a mess like basically from the time that she was 20 years old she just had like man after man uh basically not keep his promises to her so whether that was in the marriage or just in wills you know she was cut out of wills constantly and had no money had to basically fend for herself um so in that sense her life was a fitful fever um but what I find weird is that the line in Macbeth is spoken by Macbeth after he kills the first <laughs> person that he kills in the play. 
and it's spoken as sort of a justification for himself that well, that guy had a messed up life, but at least I've done him some service. Now he can sleep well. <laughs> so, what, tell me, what is it again exactly? After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well, is the original line. So it's just modified to she. Mm -hmm. Well, um, she didn't choose it. Her grandsons chose it for her. Okay. Um, but I find that, I mean, I, when I first read it, I was kind of joking with my boyfriend that I guess she was murdered because whoever wrote this <laughs> murdered her, and now they're just trying to feel better about themselves. <laughs> well, they waited an awfully long time to murder her. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, so wait, she's married, uh, buried in Greenmount Cemetery, I, I think, and her father's also buried here, but I don't think they're buried near yeah. each other. Yeah, they're not buried near each other. Admire her? Um, in a way, I guess so. She did have a really keen investment business sense, um, and it's impressive that as a woman in her time, she was able to like amass the amount of wealth that she did, having been jilted out of so many, you know, inheritances and stuff like that. So, yes, I admire her for that reason. Um, but she's very, very, very vain in so many other ways. So, for instance, um, you'll notice that all the pictures of her are painted, um, despite the fact that she lived through the time where photography was invented and she very easily could have had her photograph taken. <laughs> but well, what year was it when she died? It was like the late 1800s? Or? Yeah, late 1800s. So, photography was around for at least since the Civil War, before the Civil War. Right. She right. Never had a photo taken. Nope. And she refused to have a photo taken. Um, so I think the last portrait of her, but still, it was not done when she was an old woman. It was done like maybe in her 50s. Um, and it's just like a silhouette. So one of those, just like the black, you know, silhouette of her. Okay. And um, anyway, that's just one example of how I think, you know, she takes her image very seriously. And that was kind of what defined her whole relationship with Jerome, too, was a lot of this presentation and ostentation. Do, do, did she ever have another love affair? No. Um, and that's kind of, it's sad to me, like, the way th that she let this one very, very early thing ruin her life. Um, so I don't know. I worked at a law firm, actually, where it was family law, and so it was lots and lots of divorces and custody battles and stuff like that and we always felt saddest when it was the people who were like in their you know middle ages and maybe you know someone had a midlife crisis and decided they didn't want this marriage blah 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 that was sad but whenever it was kind of like a young couple it was always like oh well like at least they figured out that they're not a good match and then they can just go live the rest of their lives um, so it's sad that Betsy didn't like figure that out for herself when she was still young enough to have a second chance at marriage and everything else.